Before I introduce tonight's guest, I do want to acknowledge the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation, which has been a longtime friend. Some of you were here a couple of weeks ago. You know that um, we've had a lot of support this year in order to bring some wonderful, uh, thoughtful speakers to campus, uh, and uh, they've made this evening possible as well. We're very grateful for their partnership, as always, in supporting the exchange of ideas around issues of national political significance. And now I'd like to just recognize, we're delighted this evening to have their board president here, Laura Barron, who is seated right there. And um, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Laura and the foundation. Um, this is not David Frum's, I said something like this recently for those of you who were here for our last event, this is not David Frum's uh, first appearance on an Eagleton program. Uh, he was last here in 2004, 14 years ago. It was right around, time flies when you're having fun. It was uh, right around the time that his, uh, that his book co-authored with Richard Pearl, uh, An End to Evil, How to Win the War on Terror was published. And as we gather today, he has a new book called Trumpocracy, building on a March 2017 column in The Atlantic called How to Build an Autocracy. So he's, uh, he does a lot of how-to writing, um, self-help for the country. Uh, the, uh, this book, by the way, will be available uh, for purchase and signing after the program this evening, and I can tell you, uh, it's it's really something you should think about buying and reading. It's he's a wonderful writer and uh, very insightful, and I'm I'm sort of hesitating to use this word, but he's easy to read. Um, it's not that easy to absorb the implications of what he's saying, but it's 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 accessible. Both before that first visit back in 2004 um, and in the interim, he has issued by uh, our count at least six nonfiction books and a novel. The novel was called Patriots, which I understand is a political satire about a conservative president and is not a football story. I'm not sure what his interest or involvement is with football. Uh, in other words, he's a highly productive writer and thinker, you know that already, I'm sure, who has mined the right side of the spectrum to produce highly regarded treatises on a variety of topics under a wide umbrella of conservative politics. Uh, David Frum is a Canadian by birth. He earned his bachelor's and master's in history, however, on this side of the border at Yale University, and then his JD at Harvard Law School. His first book, Dead Right, was released in 1994. Uh, in between publications, he has been uh, and was well known, I think, as a speechwriter for President George W. Bush. He later wrote the first insider book about the Bush administration. He's now a senior editor at The Atlantic, uh, and a very old and admired publication that is having a significant rebirth, I think. Uh, and he's also a CNN contributor, often seen across cable television these days, these evenings. And I can tell you that if you uh, watch MSNBC at 10 o'clock tomorrow night, you might get a glimpse of him. He serves on the board of directors of the Republican Jewish Coalition, which calls itself a, quote, unique bridge between the Jewish community and Republican decision makers. He also sits on the boards of the British think tank Policy Exchange and the anti-drug policy group Smart Approaches to Marijuana. And as uh, vice chairman and an associate fellow, uh, fellow of the nonpartisan free market public policy think tank, R Street Institute. David Fromm is among those thoughtful observers, more than thoughtful, deeply intelligent, uh, thoughtful observers whose perspectives I look forward to hearing. And as I've 
hinted, sort of, uh, I do see and hear on TV almost nightly these days, he's being called on so frequently for his commentary, uh, as we're all sorting through the complexities of the news these days. So it's my great honor to welcome him back to the Eagleton podium. And before I actually bring him up, I just want to say that uh, he's going to make relatively brief remarks, uh, followed this evening by a slightly different format. We, we called it a conversation that looks a little bit like a traditional structure, and it is. Um, but we're going to have a longer than usual Q&A, the first part of which is going to be um, uh, devoted to some questions from Eagleton students who are here ready to ask them and then uh, open to the larger audience. So there'll be time for uh, a number of exchanges. And now it is indeed my pleasure to welcome to the podium and the microphone David Frum. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you to Eagleton. Thank you all. I know everyone here has braved the northern New Jersey traffic in order to be here, and I am honored by your sacrifice. Um, I really appreciate this uh, format um, of shortened remarks so we can have more of a conversation. I think um, I, I am very much looking forward to that. Uh, I think I'm on a book tour, and when you're traveling with yourself, um, giving talks and interviews over and over again, after a while, you come to feel like um, the wife of an intolerably boring man. Like if I hear that fellow talk one more time, I'm leaving. <laughs> and so I'm glad to be able to hear you talk. Um, uh, I do have a standard, or I had a standard book talk. Um, the trouble is, in the Trump administration, uh, you, you can't use it very often. Uh, it's a little bit like, the, in the olden days, you know, it was like a good men's suit. You got five or six wares between cleanings. Um, now you, you just have to discard. And so with today's news, I'm going to start there. Um, and I would like to say also a special acknowledgement to those of you who are commemorating or celebrating Purim. I'm really appreciating that you showed up sober. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> if you did, I'm assuming you did. Otherwise, you had no business braving the northern New Jersey traffic. <laughs> um, so uh, today, um, the President of the United States uh, proposed at a televised meeting with members of Congress that police should have the power to remove guns without process, gun removal first, due process second, from anyone that the police believe to be likely to misuse the guns. Now, I am one, I, as Ruth mentioned, I'm from Canada, I tend to think that Americans have defined their gun rights over broadly. Um, but even I, and, even, and, and I think everyone would say, the idea that you can, the police can seize any instrument from any person um, at their sole discretion with no process at all, that's going a little far. Um, now, President Trump, of course, he's, he was in the moment, uh, like, um, like uh, <laughs> John Belushi in Animal House, he was just rolling with it. <laughs> don't stop him. Um, I don't think those words should be taken seriously as an indication of public policy, because as Donald Trump, in a few, a few later moments, in an exchange with Senator Feinstein from California, revealed he hasn't completely thought all of these things through. I mean, he, he said to her, um, you know, that, that he, he said to the group uh, that guns like the AR-15, people are buying them on the black market because you can't just walk into a store and buy an AR-15. And, and Senator Feinstein had to say, uh, Mr. President, actually, <laughs> you can walk into a store, and people do every day. And he replied, you can? So, so he's not up on it. But what was important about that exchange, what was important about that exchange is it revealed, as so often with Donald Trump, what matters is not the ideas, because Donald Trump truly has, doesn't have political ideas, as you would ordinarily call them. But what he has is a strong set of impulses, a strong set of habits, an outlook of mind, and a ferocious will to power that bends people around him to his purposes. And his instinct, when he decided at that moment that the gun issue was causing him a problem, rather than being a source of political strength, as it has been in the, in the past, his instinct was law schmall. And this takes us to the two things I want to talk about tonight. One, briefly, about how to understand and how not to understand um, the problem and the challenge that Donald Trump presents to American democracy. And the second, something we don't talk about enough, but that I think is the theme I really want to finish with, um, and that is the reasons for hope 
in American society and the possibilities for each of us to contribute to that hope. Um, let me begin by talking about what it is that I think we have to fear. Um, in the immediate aftermath of Donald Trump's election, a lot of people compared what happened uh, to the most spectacular, most horrible instance of democratic breakdown in world history, the collapse of democratic governments in Central Europe and especially Germany in the 1930s. And one of the things that impelled me to write first the article and now the book was to explain that's not a real fear. Um, and by focusing on things that cannot happen, you're at risk of neglecting the danger of things that can. There are a lot of stops on the train line of bad before you get to Hitler station. Uh, and it is important to understand that what Donald Trump does, he operates in a big modern bureaucratic state with a legal system, with parts of the system that are within the grasp of the president and large parts of the system that are not within the grasp of the president. There are limits on what he can do. And it is important to understand what he can do and what he cannot do. But within that limit, it is also important to understand that every day, as today with his um, at statement about gun rights, that he is corroding legality and norms that are within the grasp of the presidency. Um, Donald Trump is not the heart attack of American democracy. He is the gum disease of American democracy. <laughs> and let, let me give you a very concrete example of, of how this is working. Um, we, since the creation of the modern Federal Bureau of Investigation back in the 1920s, two FBI directors have been fired by the president. One by B President Bill Clinton in the early 1990s, and the second, of course, James Camp Comey by Donald Trump. When Bill Clinton fired an FBI director back in the 1990s, he did so for cause. The FBI director was credibly excused of having misused an expense account. He did so with confrontation. The FBI director was given an opportunity to make a statement in the director's own defense and to argue that he had indeed used his expenses correctly. Um, there was a consultation with Congress. The president didn't act unilaterally, that he, um, although he didn't strictly have to, that he brought in the relevant, he didn't do it in a formal way of going to a committee because Congress doesn't ultimately remove federal office holders, but he, he, in, he consulted and he informed the relevant members of, of Congress why he was taking the step, showed the evidence of the misuse of the expense account. Um, Congress accepted the evidence as true. Um, the, FBI director was called before Congress to explain himself, given another chance to make his case, and in the end, after a period of some weeks, the decision was made to fire the FBI director. Message, although theoretically the president can fire the FBI director, in practice, because the United States does not want a presidentially directed police force at the federal level, the FBI director can only be removed for reason and with consultation. That was the principle until Donald Trump. Donald Trump fired the director of the FBI for investigating him, as he said. Uh, and as shocking as that was, he then mobilized his political party to defend and back him and to create a new rule, which, was, which has been argued by eminent law professors on great editorial pages, that the president has a right to remove the director of the FBI at any time for any reason, including shutting down an investigation that affects the president himself and his official family. Now, if Donald Trump prevails, he will have changed the law of this country. Not one of the laws that's written down, uh, but one of the laws that affects all of your rights. It is a different thing to live in a country where the federal police force is independent of politics and acts according to its own internal rules and uh, seeking genuine lawbreakers, and one where the president of the country can, for his own reasons, halt and initiate investigations at will for the president's reasons. It's a different country. And even though nothing will have been changed in the way the law of the United States is written, everything will have been changed from the point of view of being on the receiving end of the law. Um, I think you all know this. Um, and I've, I've written a lot about this. And you're kindly here to hear me tonight. So you, you have an idea of my thinking about all of this. What I want to talk about in the 10 minutes before we take questions is, are the evidences of hope. Um, I'm not a hopeful or optimistic person by temperament. Um, and I am inclined to see, um, as I, I guess Ruth indicated with the titles of the book, I'm inclined to look on danger ahead. But what I have been amazed by in the past year plus that I've been writing on the speed um, is I've been in dozens of rooms like this one, as crowded as this one, with people who are as engaged as you. And it is an inspiring thing 
I sometimes think Donald Trump has been God's ch judgment on America for not being good enough citizens, not reading enough, not paying enough attention. Um, I think one of the reasons a lot of people voted for him was that they had a false idea of who he was based on reality television. If they had read more and studied more, they would have had an idea of who their, this man was who wanted to be their president and what he stood for. Well, they didn't do it then, but we're seeing it now. 2014 was the lowest voter turnout election since 1942, and the people who didn't vote in 1942 had a good excuse. Uh, they were elsewhere. Um, 2016 was an election conducted, I think, very much in a lesser of two evils spirit without the kind of enthusiasm and belief that Americans normally bring to their politics. But I, I think in the past year and a bit, we have seen a kind of revival of civic enthusiasm. Um, Franklin Roosevelt spoke of the courage that comes from national unity. And in rooms like this, people, I know you're not here for me. And I don't even think you're here for Donald Trump. I think you're here for each other. And the sight of other people who are standing up as you are, that gives you uh, the confidence to go on. One of the things that bad governments try to do is isolate people one from another. Um, in the, the modern parlance, gaslighting, making people question their judgment. Am I, is he crazy or am I crazy? And he's president, so it must be me. Um, and, in, uh, and to incite arguments over silly things that get people in flame, in flame wars on their Facebook pages and other social media. Um, but instead, what we're seeing is a kind of national convergence. Here's what we're also seeing. And here are some things that Donald Trump has brought us. Um, he's given us a gift of wider vision. Um, America becoming, has become for a while a country in which conditions for those, the conditions for those for whom life is going well are getting better and better, and the conditions for those for whom life is not going well, our fellow country people, um, are invisible. Uh, the, it is amazing to me that you could have an opioid epidemic that was killing more people than the Vietnam War, and until last year, it went largely unnoticed in the governing class of the country. I mean, it's affected so many families, and yet somehow it didn't penetrate the political consciousness. Donald, in the Donald Trump age, as we're trying to understand how could this affliction have happened to the country, we have to see those things. Donald Trump has given us all a new appreciation of the power and greatness of truth. We've all become familiar with the phrase post-truth. It's not enough understood that post-truth, that phrase began not as a criticism, but as a compliment. It began on campuses like this one, where um, advanced thinkers argued that truth, the concept of a single truth was tyrannical, um, it was an enlightenment fallacy, it was overbearing. Uh, what we needed to do was to break the concept of truth and substitute the possibility of truths, multiple truths. Um, Oprah Winfrey was reflecting this academic thinking when she spoke at the Golden Globes this year about your truth and your truth. And I don't want to say there's nothing to that because obviously there's some power to that idea. But in politics, what we've discovered is the opposite of truth isn't truths. The opposite of truth is lying. And, and democracies can't cope with lying because in a, in a tiny aristocracy where 400 people make the decisions, they will all be pretty well informed. But in a democracy where people, we count on hundreds of millions of people to cast a vote that affects their lives, they can't know personally the things they need to know. They can only know them through, through flows of information, through mass media, and from their own government. And they have to be able to rely on that information as, as accurate, not 100%, because nothing human is perfect, and journalists, the best journalists make mistakes. Uh, and indeed, you know, the, better the better journalists sometimes make more mistakes because they are sometimes pushing the frontiers. The test of honesty and integrity in journalism is not never making a mistake. Um, but correcting your mistakes rapidly, being open to truth. Um, that journalist whom Trump always talks about, who re wrongly reported that the Winston Churchill bust, he didn't report it, uh, who wrongly tweeted that the Winston Churchill bust, sorry, the, I beg your pardon, the Martin Luther King bust had been removed from the West Wing, uh, which Donald Trump uses as an example of how the press is full of lies. He corrected that tweet within 15 minutes. He just, the, his view had been blocked and the, the bust had been moved from it to a different place. Um, so you didn't see it in a familiar place, and the room was crowded. You couldn't see exactly where it was. And then he wrote a column for the next print edition of Time magazine explaining how he'd made his mistake and how he was embarrassed about it and how he was sorry and the things he'd learned. And that's the self-correcting process. Um, you, t you make a tweet in error, you correct it, and then you self-examine, how did I get that wrong? Um, I think we've all gotten a better understanding of the difference between um, fallible but 
legitimate and honest journalism and official lying. And we've also come to see the, different, the, the danger that is posed when people in officialdom are empowered to lie. You know, many of the lies of the Trump era begin with good motives. Um, they begin with the more honorable people in the administration, um, the McMasters, the Kellys, the Mattises, trying to protect the country and the world from knowing things that would be very damaging if they came out. Uh, but the cumulative effect of lie after lie is to um, break the possibility of democratic sovereignty. And that is something that millions of Americans are waking up to. And we have seen every, in, at every legitimate news source a huge increase, not only in the number of readers, but in the intensity of the readers. Another of Donald Trump's gifts has been to make us, across the Western world, understand that we're in this together. Uh, that the techniques and methods used by the Russians to intervene in the American election are the same methods that they have they, they used in France next and in sent the countries of Central Europe before. Um, and that we, we face both within ourselves, we, we face common problems and challenges to democratic government in all the countries of the Western world, um, the winners and the losers from globalization, the stresses of demographic transition and, and immigration, those are universal things. And we also face common challenges. Um, and that we cannot solve them alone. Um, that many of our European friends have said, have often yearned for a world in which America looms smaller. Now they're getting it and they don't like it. And they, like we, are discovering American leadership is indispensable uh, to, uh, to a world that functions. We have seen, we have learned um, the importance of the invisible defenses that we get against this kind of attack, uh, that threats come not only in the form of tanks and rockets, and against which you need an army and a navy and a coast guard and an air force, but that, th um, that in the modern cyber era, threats come over the wires, and you need agencies like the National Security Agency and the FBI and the CIA to stand on guard. And that is an, a new appreciation, and maybe people on the, on the left-hand side of the spectrum um, are developing a new appreciation for um, the work that those agencies do that they might not have had three or four years ago. And on the right-hand side of the spectrum, that we have to confront what a lot of the petty and routine cruelties and unkindnesses and brutalities of life that are easy to shrug off when they happen on a small scale or between neighbors, suddenly take on a very different form when they're put in the town square on a jumbotron, a, a metaphorical jumbotron times a million. And you all have to look every day at this giant spectacle of wrongness and harshness and cruelty. Because that's the essence of Donald Trump's um, personality and of his appeal, the cruelty. You know, the Romans built the Colosseum about the year 70, and they kept it operating for about 400 years after that, twice a week, if I remember right, um, and full, as I understand it, much of the time, watching people hack themselves to pieces. That there is a human appetite for the cruel, and it, is, it can be exciting. It can be galvanizing. And that's, I think, what, some, what you sometimes hear when people want to say, I just love watching him. Many of your friends and neighbors may say this. They are excited by it. But what has also been true of human beings is over the longer term, the, the parts of us that are kind and generous um, and tolerant and sympathetic, those become stronger. Uh, and that may be the real message of the Trump years and the real gift, um, a, a, a rediscovery of the central, centrality of the value of of kindness, not just in personal affairs and as in public affairs, but in public affairs too, and not just in public affairs, but in personal affairs. I don't think it's a coincidence that the message, the Me Too message of dignity um, and decency and the treatment between men and women has accelerated so much in the Trump era. Uh, it, the Trump era has been the accelerant for this. You know, I sometimes think, I'm, I'm sure as experienced northern New Jersey drivers, none of this is true of you. But I sometimes think of a little foible of my own, um, which is it has sometimes happened to me that when I'm driving on the highway, I get a little dozy. And I don't pull over as I should, but I insist that I can muscle through the doziness. And this has happened once or twice, and then sudden, suddenly you'll be jerked awake because you're looking into the high beams of a truck, and, the, and you're startled by this imminence of danger. And the surge of adrenaline, from that terror, that moment of terror, is exactly the same force that drives, brings you safely home. And that Donald Trump may be all of that for us. What you can do, uh, what each of us can do, is, is make a difference. And as, not just as at the voting booth, but in, in all of your daily life. And, and I 
come here with really three suggestions for what you can, as an individual can do. The first is to remember that if you carry one of these, and probably everybody in this room does, you command more instantaneous communications power than Walter Cronkite ever knew. Use it wisely. Let the fake news stop with you. Uh, if you get a tweet or see a Facebook message, do not pro uh, forward it unless you have made some effort to investigate it. Because it's not just uh, on the pro-Trump side that fake news flourishes, but on Trump, the Trump skeptical side, it does too. Um, be, remember, you're not just a news consumer, you are an, a news maker, you're a news distributor. And think that way and take on board that responsibility. Uh, the second thing um, that I, I think we can, uh, we can all do is to try to understand that the values that Donald Trump daily offends in public are values that we all have an option to live by in our personal lives. Um, that to try to be kindlier, more tolerant, more, uh, you know, a more understanding of others. Um, and if you, are some, if you are one of those to whom some of the advantages of life have been dealt, to be more conscious of those advantages. The greatest of American novels, um, in the opening paragraph, the narrator is told by his father, whenever you're inclined to criticize somebody, remember that not everyone in life has had all the advantages that you have had. Um, and although Nick Carraway is a very complicated figure, and although that line has got a lot of irony to it, it's, I think they should still print it on the $20 bill. Um, and it's something that, um, that, we, that we need to keep in mind. And everyone in this room um, needs to think, um, you know, you've had the advantages of, of a great educational institution like this or others like it. You know, it is, there is a competition in American life often for peop people to claim the greater sense of victimhood. I think people need to actually start competing to say, you know what, I want to talk about the advantages I've had and the, responsi the responsibilities that come with them. I'm not going to apologize for them um, because fate is kind of random, but I'm going to live up to them and make the best of them and use them, and, and use them for the good of others. And then the last thing um, I think that we can do is um, bear, keep in mind always the possibilities of a new kind of politics. Now, we've been frozen in a lot of debates since about the year 1990, um, probably having to do with the end of the Cold War. But a lot of our politics has been very similar over a quarter century um, with uh, the same answers, even as they keep changing the questions, the answers, uh, the answers never change. Uh, and we have, our politics has become stale and out of date. That is, I think, about to break. And we have to be ready for new possibilities and new, the, a new shape of politics. A lot, a lot of the party system that we have grown up with, that is about to change. Um, and this could be a truly redemptive thing because American politics has gotten worse and worse and worse at solving problems that people care about as it has become more and more stereotyped. All of this may be about to break, and all we can do is be ready. So much of politics is about being ready for the moment. Um, that you, and you never know when that moment will come, and maybe it never does. But to be ready for that moment, because I think it is about to be a very, very different world than the world we've known for the past quarter century. So let me pause there. I actually went over quota of my minutes. Um, but I thank you, and I'm delighted to take questions from the students and then from all of you. Uh, so thank you. Before I turn it to the it's me. Before I turn it to the students, um, I just want to, uh, if you don't, if you'll just indulge me, I'd like to start with one question. Uh, that, uh, if you don't, uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read the the, dedica the dedication yes. in the book. Uh, so the book is dedicated to my children and then their names. You teach me more than I taught you. This battered world your elders bequeath you, you will make it better in admiration and love. And when I read that, uh, it was, it's, it's very moving and it was very familiar to me in a, in a somewhat different way. Uh, you know, I've lived through years and decades of people standing up at meetings. We used to do this all the time. Uh, early in the days, uh, when there were women in, uh, you know, women's meetings, women in politics meetings, the kinds of meetings I went to many years ago when we uh, established the Center for American Women at Politics. And women would get up and they would say, well, the situation is the way it is now. 
between men and women, but I'm going to bring up a new generation of sons, and these sons are going to be different. They're, they're going to learn from what's happening, and the relationships will be different. And in fact, largely, uh, that has not been true. It's, there are some incremental changes, but it is so, uh, it's not easy, but it is a way we turn. And in the recent horrible situation that we've seen in Florida, um, it's unbelievable, uh, fascinating, hopeful to see what these students are doing. But it's that same kind of impulse. They will save the world that we have not. Uh, and then we all get older and we turn to the next generation and we say, you'll do better than we did. But the world has turned for centuries uh, with the same pattern. So you're doing it in your dedication. I want to know where you where that comes from and how you invest that expectation. Oh, okay. Well, I want to make it clear, I'm not speaking about everybody's children. A lot of children are making things worse. Uh, uh, we are all everybody's children. Um, uh, well, first I dedicated it to them, not for any larger reason, but because um, they were, they were uh, much on my mind for particular reasons at the time of the writing of the book. Um, they had each in their own way struck out on a, a different path um, at that moment. And so, um, and uh, it had been a while since I dedica dedicated any book to any of my children. And at the time I did it last, there were only two of them, and the third was getting a little restive. Uh, uh, but he here's what, what, I, what I would say. One of, the thing, one of the things that afterwards, when I thought of, when I, I've got, gotten asked about it a few times, um, I remember... Um, I read an article in 2009 about, about Rush Limbaugh. And the thing that had particularly provoked this particular article, and there are a lot of things that are very provoking about Rush Limbaugh, but the thing that particularly provoked it was he had done a big speech that Fox News had covered in which he had given a, a message to the parents of America. This is 2009, just after the 2008 election, and there was a big age skew in the way the voting had gone. And Limbaugh's message to the parent of, parents of America was stop, you, you know, that you have to teach, in, impose, and insist on your children that they do the right thing, that you should tell them how to live because you are older and you know better. And I thought as I listened to this, there speaks a man with no children. <laughs> <laughs> because I think especially as we get older, it isn't that one generation of human beings is smarter than another or knows more, uh, but your children are ambassadors from the future. And if you want to stay, as we get live longer and longer and stay active longer and longer, if you want to talk about the world that exists rather in, out there rather than the world that exists in here, um, that you need to engage with them, be, as we're going to do tonight, because they're going to tell you how it is. Um, as I said, the, 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 the fact that the greatest fact of politics is change, and that the questions change all the time. Um, and if you don't absorb the new questions, um, you will be insisting on answers that are of no use to anybody. And politics is an occupation where you are judged not by whether you are, are, your heart is in the right place, you're judged by whether you are useful or not. Not satisfied. No, I've done my best. <laughs> I'll turn to the students. Hi, I'm Stephen Haverlock, an Eagleton undergrad associate and a double major in women's and gender studies and human resources. So my question is, do you believe that we have the right to lie intentionally or spread fake news based on our First Amendment rights, even if those lies undermine our democracy and the way that it can function? Well, that's, an interesting, that's a very interesting and challenging question. I, we, it begins with the question, who is we? Um, do you as an individual have a legal right to post something on Facebook that you know is untrue? I suppose the answer is you do. Does Facebook? have a right, if it knows that this is going on on a large scale, to do nothing? That's a different question. Um, because, uh, let, let me put it this way, if Facebook were reconceptualized as the Washington, as a media company, it would not. A media company is liable for what appears on its pages. If there's a defamatory statement of a, uh, inside the Washington Post, the Washington Post is liable. Um, Facebook and other companies have, um, carved out in the Communications Act of 1996 a special exemption that uh, um, says they are not liable for any of these things. So who is the we? Um, 
And I think that one of the things that is um, one of the explosive questions, and it will probably be addressed in, in the European Union before the United States, is that Facebook has played a large role in enabling, um, not just in the United States, but across the world, a lot of politically intended disinformation. Because the lies, some of the lies are just made out by ordinary people, it's true, but a lot of them are produced by associations and sometimes by states. Um, and does Facebook have a moral obligation? Separate those questions, and I think it points the way to a different kind of answer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Mike Kleinman. I'm an undergraduate associate. I think most of us are. Um, I'm an English and economics double major. So I'll preface my question by saying that I'm very interested in like language in politics and how candidates present themselves and what's acceptable to say. Yeah. And I suspect that you being having been a speechwriter working at The Atlantic probably are too. So do you think that the way that Trump has presented himself and the way that he uses language, do you think that's going to affect how language functions for yes. future political candidates and in what ways? That's a superb question. And, and yes, well, I can see one effect that um, it will have. And Donald Trump says shocking things, things that would normally be career ending for anybody. And yet his career is obviously not ended, not yet anyway. Um, one of the remarkable things about the polling of Donald Trump's appeal in the last month of the election, um, there was a, I cite in the book, there's a poll conducted where he, the, the, uh, he's asked, the, poll, the people in the sample are asked questions about which candidate is more like this or more like that. And this is generally Donald Trump gets very bad grades. On the questions, cares about people like you, has the right temperament to be president, he, he scores terribly. And so this is not a pro-Trump sample. But asked who is more honest? Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, the sample gave the nod to Donald Trump as more honest than Hillary Clinton, and not by a small margin, but by quite a big one. So what was going on there? Because Donald Trump obviously lies all the time. And uh, my hypothesis is that while Donald Trump lies, what he, doesn't, what he never does is equivocate. Politicians equivocate. Uh, they're asked a question. Um, are you for ethanol or are you against it? Um, now, Donald Trump will take the temperature of the room and say yes or no. Um, and then the next day he will say no or yes and not be bound. But mo most politicians don't want to do that. They don't, because they do not want to outright lie, they go yamana, 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 and they end up on both sides of the ethanol question. And that's what it means to talk like a politician. And what Donald Trump has demonstrated um, is that there is a tremendous appetite for people who do not talk like politicians. Um, the problem is it's very risky for a, an honest person not to talk like a politician because you know, the, you're in a room full of people who like, want the answer yes to the ethanol question, but you're in a country where people may want the answer no, and how, how do you do that? But I think, I think we may see um, uh, an awareness that there is an appetite for people who equivocate less, but without solving the problem by outright lying. Hi, um, my name is Riley Link. Um, I'm studying public health. And I have a more specific question. So in your book, um, you discuss how military commanders aren't necessarily well suited um, to governing and that the military is operating, operating with less civilian oversight. So given that, are you concerned with the fact that Americans tend to trust military more than other institutions, especially um, now and what the potential consequences of that may be. Okay, thank you. Um, it doesn't bother me that Americans trust them. I mean, uh, your military is a fantastic institution. The thing, and, and when applied to its proper job, it is amazingly capable. And the people you will meet there, and I, if you, many of you have spent time with them, are astonishingly capable people. And, it very, and, um, and the stereotypes of the past, I mean, the upper reaches of the military are full of people who are extremely well-educated and conscious. And um, no, I, you can't think too highly of them. Uh, the problem is that they're the only institution we respect. Um, so uh, you know, very few of us imagine that we can plan our own war. Uh, but a lot of us think, if we get sick, that we can, to use your area of expertise, that we can figure out our own course of treatment um, on the internet. And when a doctor says that, that um, sorry, marijuana will not cure your cancer, um, that we get impatient and we say, but I found, read this on the internet. Um, so the military is an exception to a general crisis of faith in institutions. That is, a, that is a great problem in American society. The danger in the Trump era is, uh, precisely because they are so capable and so honorable. 
in an administration where so where the average level of competence and ethics is not so high that the military is tending not only to get more power but also to get more autonomy. And you see again and again how a lot, the military is responding to the Trump era by separating itself from the rest of the government and from and from and ignoring civilian control because it's getting a lot of orders that it regards as unacceptable in one way or another. But you know, after, after the Charlottesville incident, where every commander of every service found some way to post a public statement of criticism of the president, I think probably a lot of people found that heartwarming. But that's a terrible precedent. Um, it is not the job of the military to say, Are we, this, this, these remarks the president made, we find them unacceptable. And for all of them to do it at once in a way that's coordinated, and I understand it has to do with their recruitment and managing, you know, their force management, but it's, it's dangerous. Um, and what we are seeing, uh, this is one of the real risks of the Trump era, is that we are seeing that these agencies and the intelligence agencies, which, which have always been a little uncomfortable with civilian supervision to begin with, are escaping. Let me give you one very dramatic example of what I have in mind. Um, from the end of World War II until the middle 1970s, Congress did not supervise the CIA and FBI at all. They were supervised by the presidency and not very closely. Uh, after the revelation of the scandals of the middle 70s involving both the FBI and CIA, Congress created these intelligence committees, one of the House and one of the Senate, to supervise the agencies. But the agencies didn't like it. They were that those that they would be they would be leaky, that there would be partisan wrangling. But for half a century, the committees more or less lived up to everybody's hopes. They have been, by and large, not leaky. Uh, the people on them have been carefully selected to be uh, cut above the usual member of Congress. Um, Watching the performance of the House Committee in particular over the past year, if you're at the CIA, you think they're leaking, they're leaking, they're leaking untruthfully, they're leaking for partisan reasons, uh, they are attacking the agencies, especially the FBI. How forthcoming in future will those agencies, which never like reporting to Congress anyway, be to members of Congress? And what is lost when the FBI and CIA decide, you know, we're going to not share as much with Congress as we used to? It's very hard to know what they're up to. A lot of their cooperation is more or less voluntary, and that cooperation may be less forthcoming in the years ahead because of the clownish antics of, De of Devin Nunes, but it's not going to be Devin Nunes who loses as a result. We all will. Hi, my name is Dana, and I wanted to know how do you think bipartisanship functions today um, rather than it did 20 years ago? Thank you. Um, um, what has happened over the past generation is um, in your parents' or maybe your grandparents' time. Uh, uh, your party identity didn't always map very closely to other things around you. That uh, there are Democrats and Republicans who own guns. Uh, there are Democrats and Republicans who are Catholic or Protestant, uh, who went to church or who didn't. Um, there are Democrats and Republicans who lived in cities or lived in the country. Um, it, it was it was a it was a, a a part of your identity that had a very contingent relationship to the other parts of your identity. What has happened in recent years is that being a Democrat or Republican has become, for many people, the most important thing about them, and a the thing that links to everything else. So, if you're a gun owner, you're a Republican. You live in the country, you're a Republican. You live in a big city, you, you go to the museums, you're a Democrat. And uh, uh, and. Uh, and I don't, I'm sorry, that drew a lot, it wasn't intended to draw a lot, because I don't think one of those identities is better than another, but, but it, 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 has become a, a, it has become an organizing principle for people in a way it didn't used to be. Um, I think you've all seen, there's this famous statistic um, that, in which people were asked, how would you feel if your son or daughter married a member of the other political party from your own? And in 1960, about 5% of Americans cared, and today about half care. Um, so that, that is, is because it's linking up to other things they also care about. So in that, by, the failure of bipartisanship is not just a failure of the party system. It is an indication of the increasing tribalization of American society. And that tribalization is something that uh, is a social, social, not a political fact, and, and demands social answers. And it's, the political system is not going to be able to overcome it on its own. But what, what can happen, I, I think I'm not interested in restoring bipartisanship as such. What I mean, uh, I accept it as that it's gone, um, and it was a product of certain specific facts in the 1960s and 70s that are not going to return. What what we need are rules of the road. Uh, you know, when we all want to see companies compete vigorously, but we don't want to see Hertz and Avis competing by slashing each other's tires. 
um, that there are things that they can do and there are things that they can't. And one of the things that has been true in the most recent years is the party competition has become more savage and unbounded. So my goal would be not to restore bipartisanship, but to restore a sense of what is legitimate, a legitimate way of doing political opposition and, and what is not. I mean, very spe some specific examples. You cannot threaten to default on the national debt in order to get your way. You just can't do that. And we need to make that a taboo again, that you can't do it. Um, and uh, that the kind of things that Devin Nunes is doing at the House Intelligence, you just can't do that. That's outside, you can do a lot of other stuff. Um, and you don't have to be nice to each other. You don't have to be friends. You don't have to cooperate. Uh, but you, there are, there, we have to restore subconstitutional limits and sublegal limits that say, even though this is something that you, even though it's theoretically possible for the Senate to filibuster every member of the president's cabinet, every judge and every general, it's still not appropriate. And, and restoring that sense is a task for the generation ahead. Yes, sir. All right, thank you so much, first off, for coming. Oh, thank you. Uh, and second off, my name is John Crouchman, and I'm a political science major, and this question has been burning ever since Trump ran for president. So I'm just gonna ask it right now. <laughs> so do you believe that Donald Trump's prior status as a reality television television host and celebrity played a big factor in his election? If so, do you think this creates a path for future celebrities to run and potentially win the presidency? You mean, should we be getting ready for President Winfrey? Uh, <laughs> um, President uh, Oprah Winfrey said she was waiting for a clear sign from God before she ran for president. I think that's a good advice. You, every, we all should wait for a clear sign from God before <laughs> running for president. Uh, uh, but it's, it, we were talking about this at dinner. It's a great question. And I think the answer is, is yes to the first yes to the first half and no to the second. And here's why the answer, why it was so important for Donald Trump that he was a reality star. Because it was not just reality TV, it was the part he played. He played an effective, caring business leader. Now think about what people have been through in the past 15 years. One brainwave from elite groups after another that led to calamity. And one example after another of, of, of irresponsibility from elites. Bill Maher's best joke, um, you'll remember that he got into trouble for what he said after 9-11. He said, how is it that the only person who was fired for 9-11 was a comedian? Uh, no one was fired. It's the biggest security failure since Pearl Harbor, and no one was held to account. And you go, uh, after the um, housing market meltdown, you know, the, uh, the rating agencies who made it all possible, nobody was held to account, ever. And here's this person who goes on TV every week, and he plays a businessman who uh, leads small group exercises and holds people to account. And when you fail, what was his trademark phrase? You're fired. In a country where ordinary people get fired for everything, and important people get fired for nothing. And I, yeah, I think that, that it, but it wasn't, that, it wasn't that he was a celebrity, because I think people understand the difference. They're not going to vote for a Kardashian president. But it was, he was, he was, he was playing a role in something that they were led to believe was more than fiction. And people, and this is a part of the failure of citizenship. I mean, there's a real gap in public education where they did not know that reality TV is fake. Uh, <laughs> and that they should have been paying more attention. I mean, you know, others should help them, but it's also your own job to understand the government of your country. We all have a responsibility to do that. But I think that that part he played was one that a lot of people found inspiring. And I think a lot of people who voted for him I mean, a lot of people voted for him for terrible reasons of all kinds, but I think a lot of people voted for him because they thought, here's somebody who's going to be able to get things done. I saw it on TV. <laughs> um, all right, so we now open the, the room to the... Now we got it. Oh, there are more students. I'm sorry. Hi, so my name's Kyle Bright. I'm also a student at Rutgers, economics and political science major. This question's partially because we had Bill Crystal here a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about the 2018 elections, and yeah. he said he wouldn't mind seeing Democrats take the House because of better oversight of Trump. He yeah. had some qualms about it, but so my question for you is, which party do you want to see have control of House or Senate or the branches of Congress after the 2018 elections? I see. Um, uh, it's, that's a difficult question to me for me to answer uh, because for a very simple reason, which is the Atlantic has extremely strict rules about saying or doing anything to endorse candidates. Um, so I have to be 
I just, I, I, institutionally, I, it's not a question I'm sort of entirely comfortable answering the way that you would like me to. Um, let me, so I'm gonna, let me put a, a answer, a different question from the one you asked. Um, <laughs> which is, um, I think the 2018 elections are going to test a lot of our political science because one of the things we know about off-year elections is that the party of the president tends to, to lose. And I don't have the figures in my head, but they're in the book. There's an average of how much the party of the president tends to lose. And there's a, I think it's like 12 is the average. If the, if the president is below 50% approval, however, then the party of the president tends to lose a lot more. And again, I don't remember it's in the book, but I think it's 36. But here's the problem, or here's the interesting question. Why are presidents below 50%? Usually for one of two reasons. Because there's a war that's not going well or because the economy's not doing well. What if the president's below 50% because people just think he's a jerk, but, but the economy is doing well and uh, there isn't, I mean, we're, the United States is engaged in combat operations all over the world, but there isn't a major war on and it's not perceived to be going badly. If the president is going, is under 50% for reasons that are different from the normal reasons of politics, how does that bleed back into the congressional elections. We're about to find out. But it is, um, it is not unimaginable to me uh, that um, the Democrats don't do as well as people think. One more thing. Right now, it feels like the gun issue is going to work for the Democrats for the first time. And it, you read, there's a lot of reporting that says the normal rules of politics are suspended, that normally the gun, the pro-gun side, which is a minority, cares more, and the uh, gun skeptical side, which is the majority, cares less. Uh, and this time, a lot of people are saying, no, it's different. They're going to be mobilized. But what if between now and November, the usual rules reassert themselves and the gun issue becomes a Republican advantage rather, rather than a Democratic disadvantage? And, and, and a lot of Democratic senators in red states, which is who the field is in 2018, find themselves in trouble because of it. So um, the assumption that this is a big Democratic wave that is coming, I mean, uh, there are a lot of reasons to expect it, but there are some, I think, more profound reasons to wonder whether all of those rules that have held in the past will hold this time, too. Hi, uh, Nick Polita. I was wondering, what differences have you perceived uh, between how members of Congress interact with President Trump and how they interacted with President Bush, uh, both on a professional level uh, in terms of lawmaking, but also uh, you know, to, to the extent that you're aware on a personal level? Okay. Um, I can certainly answer that about President Bush. And I, from Donald Trump, I know what I see on TV, actually. Um, so I, I, I'm, I imagine I'm not in a room with a lot of people who are very sympathetic to George W. Bush. But um, Bush had, you don't get even to be governor of a state, never mind president of the United States, without being pretty good at reading people. And not just what they say, but what they really mean. And, and George Bush was, in a, was a, a very sensitive reader of members of Congress, what they, what they needed and, the, and what, what they could do. And the result was, and he was a very convivial person, easy to get along with. Um, and, uh, and he also understood um, the kinds of things a politician must always honor. There's certain kind, there are a lot of commitments in politics that you know, everyone understands. Uh, I'm going to balance the budget. Well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, but if you say, I will be there for your fundraiser, you have to be there. And George Bush understood that. And he had, so he, he built a community. It was a family business. He was in the second generation of it. And it had been built through these codes of mutual obligation. Um, and people also knew, uh, it, the other difference was he had things, there were issues he cared about a lot. And there were issues he cared about much less. And so on the issues he cared about a lot, he would lead. And on the issues he cared about less, he would defer and let Congress lead. And, um, and that, that meant um, his relationships with Congress were transactional, but they, the, the, the role of the president in the system was always clear. So what is going on, Donald Trump has no priorities in Congress. It's really kind of amazing. Um, remember, he, he cannot be trusted. Uh, he can't be trusted by Republicans. I mean, what he did to the Republicans at today's gun meeting, um, probably most people in the room are unsympathetic to the Republican position, but just put yourself. I mean, you know, your Second Amendment people, this is your commitment. Uh, this is the party's commitment. The president has insisted. And then he's sitting, giving everything away and, and mocking you, saying to, 
Pat Toomey, the Republican senator from Pennsylvania, the least gun enthusiastic Republican in the Senate, that you're afraid of the NRA, insulting him to his face in front of the TV cameras. I mean, how does somebody, de how do you deal with members like that? He, uh, they obviously, they have no respect for him. Um, and uh, you can't do transactions with him. But what, they've, uh, what he's offered them instead is because, unlike George Bush, with things he cared about more and things he cared about less, Trump is completely absent from the field of public policy. So he offers them this intoxicating deal if you will give me impunity for my misconduct, I will sign whatever bill you send in front of me. And, and they say, well, you know, we don't like you, but we like power. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Carlos Hurtado. Um, during your time with the administration, with the Bush administration, you were very vocal about your support of the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, what was your reasoning behind the decision? And looking back on it now, do you think you made the right choice in supporting the war? Um, I will, I'll direct you to, I'll give you a short answer and direct you to a longer. I've written a lot about this. Uh, I've got a website called davidfrum.com and there's a button um, under journalism where I've written a lot, I've gathered a lot of articles I've written about this and other things which, about which I have uh, different thoughts. Um, I, would, I think it would be more accurate to say I was an outspoken advocate of the war after I left the administration. Inside the administration you're not supposed to talk. Um, and. Uh, 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 so, but when, uh, when I came out, I, I was an outspoken advocate of the war. Um, I believe that Saddam Hussein was imminently on the verge of getting very dangerous weapons, and I also believed he was a threat to the peace of the region. Um, he, he, was a, he had um, invaded Kuwait in 1990. He nearly did it again in 1994. He'd started a war with Iran um, in 1980. Um, and uh, in the um, upheaval that was obviously coming after 9-11, he was going to be a dangerous actor. Um, and uh, I think we have we, we have seen we have seen through the Arab world um, that dictators like him create conditions that lead to explosions in their society. That's the story of Libya. That's the story of, of Syria. Um, I took for granted two things. Uh, one was that the, that that the weapons were real, um, and two that the United States would have an effective plan for keeping order. Uh, in, in Iraq afterwards. And it wasn't, if, had, we talk, had we been having this conversation in 2002 or 2003, I wouldn't even have said those things because I would have just assumed they were true. Um, and both of those things did not turn out to be true. Um, and so the war s spiraled out of control. Um, I continue to this day, I have um, very mixed feelings about it because I don't know. One of the things about politics is you never know what's behind door number two. And um, I don't know what the Middle East would have looked like if the United States had said, right, we're not do what we're, we're going to do instead is we're going to stand back and watch the sanction regime deteriorate, as it was deteriorating, um, and uh, wait for the Saddam Hussein regime to come to its natural end, which would have looked a lot like Syria. Um, would that have been better? I don't know. I don't know what's behind door number two. Um, as, as for we say regrets, I think one of the things I, I'm a huge believer of in politics is when you've taken a public side, um, if, you ch if you change your mind intellectually about something, and I've changed my mind about things, I think you owe people an account. Um, but if you've taken a stand uh, and, you're, uh, and other people just haven't liked it, you just have to take your lumps on it. And I think those of, uh, the Iraq war is not regarded as a success by most Americans, and I think those of us who are involved in the advocacy and planning, you know, that, uh, that marks us. And that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump is president, That's one, because the Republican Party united around somebody with the last name Bush, which struck me as an unwise thing to do. Um, with no disrespect to Jeb Bush, who's a very attractive figure in a lot of ways. Um, so I, but I take, my, I take my lumps on it. Hi, my name is Sophia. Um, I want to know in what ways you think Trump and the news media in all its forms have a sort of mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship? Yes. Okay, when, when you think, that's a fascinating question. When you think news media, you mean the New York Times, CNN, uh, the prestige media. The most important media company in the country is Facebook, and some of the others are Reddit and Twitter, uh, and maybe the New York Times is in the top five, but most of the other things that you think of as traditional media, um, they're very important for people like those in this room, but they're not how this nation gets its news. Um, so I think when we think about media and its problems, we need a much more expansive definition of what media is. And then the relationship 
um, is not symbiotic at all. Um, that uh, it is it is true that um, Donald Trump has been healthy for subscriptions to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and I'll say the Atlantic. Um, people are subscribing more and reading more. Um, but it's also true that he's, cre he's, making, he's created conditions in which journalists find it almost impossible to do the jobs that they want to do. Um, people, do not come into, people do not go into journalism in order to fight with the people in government. Um, they, they assume the people in government have secrets that they don't want exposed, and journalists are people who love finding what those secrets are. But um, at, at its best, they, they, journalism works best when you are work with people in government who understand that your role is a legitimate one, even if it's sometimes uncomfortable, that it's, it's legitimate. And it's, it's a very uh, difficult thing to work with people who don't regard it as legitimate. And many of my colleagues, I won't say this about myself, but many of my colleagues work with a level of physical threat, uh, not from the government, but from you know, weak-minded people. Remember the gunman who showed up at CNN headquarters intending to commit a mass murder? Um, that people uh, live with this as a reality. Um, and women in journalism in particular live with a kind of abuse accelerated by the ready availability of social media. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I, so I have one of my colleagues at The Atlantic, Julia Yaffe, who wrote a profile in uh, GQ about uh, the early life of Melania Trump, found herself on the receiving end of just the most uh, vile, pornographic, anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. cruel, and but very personal from people who indicated they knew things about her. Um, and that's not something that anybody should have to live with in, in any trade. Um, Donald Trump keeps saying that uh, the media is happy that his presidency is taking the form that it does because it gets them more ratings. Um, but you know, people and people go into journalism as they go into politics for mostly public spirited reasons. That, that any that, that the rewards for I mean, unless you're you know Bill O'Reilly blowhard, but for most people in journalism, the rewards at the top of profession are not as big as the rewards and material rewards in other areas of life. The rewards are psychic that you're feeling you're playing a part in the public life of the country and and doing a service, and um, it is um, vexing and upsetting for people to work for an administration that regards itself as immune to the press, doesn't understand what the press does, um, and that doesn't play by the rules of a normal functioning administration. We do have time for some questions from the rest of the audience. Please wait for the microphone and state your name and where you're from. So I'm gonna start at the back of the room if I can and then sort of move, move, move forward. Um, uh, to cope, and and uh, I'm going to try to achieve a little bit of gender balance if that's possible. Um, so uh, if, maybe I, Danielle, can you sort sure. of start at the back and just see if please raise forward? your hand if you have a question. So I'll start over here with the woman over here. Right here, ma'am. <laughs> Hi. Um, oh, I am. My name is Cheryl. I'm from Highland Park. Um, do you believe that the two-party system is sacrosanct, sacrosanct and um, if, the, if our party system is going to change, will the nation, will the democracy survive three parties? I don't think the, the two-party system is sacrosanct, but I think it's practically unavoidable. So long as the elect, you all remember Bush v. Gore I mean, so, and, and the role Ralph Nader played. So long as you have an electoral college, um, a, third par a third choice ends up hurting uh, the candidate whom the people who vote for the third choice like is their next choice and ends up helping the choice that is their least choice. And uh, that is just, that's an unavoidable fact of the electoral college. Where there have been th third party candidates for president before, they have tended to be from um, highly specific issues that are not being represented by the political system. Um, like uh, George Wallace ran as a third party candidate in 1968 because both the parties, neither of the parties was segregationist anymore and there were a lot of segregationists in America and so he gave voice to them. And at other times, you know, uh, people who are pro-inflation or people who are uh, pro-temperance, um, they got their third party, or uh, socialists, they got a third party choice. But those were always protest parties, never real contenders for power. Um, and so long as the rest of the political system does its financing based on the presidential race, it is locked into a two-party choice, especially because of the first-past-the-post first system of most. Um, that, that isn't in the Constitution. You don't have to have it that way, but that's American law and history. What, what people have done, when people have been dissatisfied with the two-party system, 
um, they have usually found it easier to change one or another of the parties than to create a third party. And we've all lived through that. Um, that the Republican Party didn't used to be an ideologically conservative party. And in the 19, between 1964 and 1980, people were dissatisfied with the old Republican Party, made a new Republican Party. And in the same way in the Democratic Party a little later, that it had been a, a messy national coalition of different kinds of groups. It was not a liberal party, but between you know, 19, 1980 and the present, it has become a liberal party for the same reasons. Um, I think as those two terms um, stop describing the country so well, um, there will, you'll see as new political forces arise and new political tendencies arrive, they will tend to change the parties from within. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't see a third party as a way to go. And one, la one last thing to bear in mind is you'll see these statistics about how rising numbers of Americans are independent. And what it's natural to believe is that those people, if you're dissatisfied with the party, that all the other people who are dissatisfied with parties are dissatisfied with the same reasons that you are. But the independents are often all the people who are left over for every reason from the main parties. And, um, and often they are left out, they feel left over because they are more extreme rather than more moderate. So it is important to remember independent does not mean centrist, and centrist does not mean moderate. Those are three different concepts. Uh, but I think the future is that they will have a Republican and a Democratic Party for a long time to come, but they will have very different content from the content they have now. Danielle, can you? Hi, my name is Brad. Uh, I had a question following up on your comment before about the Republican Party and, and their power and how they treat Trump and the relationship because early on it seemed to me that they were repelled by Trump's actions but now it seems something far more insidious is happening and that is he's a useful distraction while they are able to push through their agenda much more quietly and it's really forming a total head fake on the country as to what's happening. But what bothers me is, is it seems like the Democrats are stupid. They just take the bait time and time again that they are still made up of that party of various liberal interests. They're not unified around any single yeah. one, and they're being taken apart by them. And my question to you is, is do you see any change in that? Because the way they're going, there's no way that they're going to win this next election or the one afterwards because they have no leadership around a common cause. Uh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I'm, like, I'm not in the business of offering advice to Democrats, but here's something I observe. Um, it's always a problem when you're the party out of, uh, not in the presidency, that you don't have, American politics no longer has ways for the party that doesn't have the presidency to make unified decisions. You know, there was a time when you had, you know, the head of the, if you, in the Democratic Party, even if it didn't have the presidency, the head of the AFL-CIO and the head for Americans of Democratic Action and other pressure groups like that would have a conversation and they would be able to influence collectively the party. But those mechanisms don't exist in the modern world. And the result is, um, this is just an inevitable feature of the way the modern congressional system works, is uh, you have multiple voices and multiple interests. The biggest Achilles heel of the Democratic Party is the gap in interest between those Democrats who are focused on 2018 and those Democrats who are focused on winning the Democratic primary in the spring of 2020. And the Democrats who are focused on the Democratic primary are competing to pull the party to the left when uh, the biggest, when the way that the party can make the most immediate impact, um, the, few, the way the Democrats gain, regain a bigger share of national power in 2018 is by focusing on those parts of the country where um, especially the women voted for Romney in 2012, more or less enthusiastically, voted for Trump in 2016 reluctantly, and who are available now in 2018 because of Trump's behavior and the gun issue. You know, uh, the, Republic, the suburbs of Philadelphia and um, you know, the um, air, suburban uh, Milwaukee and place, places like that. Um, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, disaffected parts, of, the parts of California that are not rural but are sort of the, the coast, the Republican seats in coastal California, um, the remaining Republican seats here in New Jersey. Those are the places where the Democrats make their obvious pickup in 2018. And that requires one set of approaches, but the interests of the 2020 class point to a different one. And the, the, and the way the Democrats, I thought, got really mousetrapped was when they got 
they got must trust by the government shutdown. Because here was something that through the Obama years, the Democrats had pointed to as a sign of Republican irresponsibility and unseriousness. They should never have used this tool. This is about restoring the taboos. This is a tool never to use. And then they got mousetrapped on how they used it. Because they, they went into the government shutdown for two reasons. And you should never in politics have two reasons for doing anything. Um, uh, because it, you, you lose clarity. They had two reasons. They wanted to force the um, revival of the children's health insurance program, and they wanted to do something about the DACA population. The Republicans, as soon as they shut down the government, instantly gave, surrendered on the CHIP program, as it was predictable they would, turning the shutdown into a shutdown over the DACA population, which is exactly where, Demo where the 20, class of 2020 wants to be, but not where the class of 2018 needs to be. Um, I think this is one of the places where you as citizens um, can make a difference. That, in that world where there isn't a head of the AFL-CIO and there isn't a head of Americans for Democratic Action and there isn't a room that citizens um, working together can talk to their, to their representatives about what the game is. Um, and, um, and basically that means that, 20, you know, uh, leave 2020 to its own devices, um, focus on 2018, and, and keep in mind always that the, the place, the, um, the, immediate, the, the ripest place for the Democrats to be um, is, well, down the road in Pennsylvania, we, I talk about this in the book, that both Trump and Pat Toomey won 1.2 million votes in the state of Pennsylvania. But Toomey ran 200,000 votes ahead of Trump in the Philadelphia suburbs, and Trump ran 200,000 votes ahead of Toomey in the rest of the state. So those 200,000 people who voted for Toomey but not for Trump, and the 30,000 more who might have done with a little bit more effort, those, uh, you know, that's, that's the place where the Democrats can reap their most immediate gains, but those are not Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders voters. Hi, Mr. Frum. Hello. Uh, my name is David. I'm a graduate student here at Rutgers. And as I'm sure most readers, I'm sorry, of newspapers in the room, as well as you are aware, there has been a decline in America's standing in the world in most countries. However, there are two exceptions that I can think of. Russia and Israel. Yeah. And so what I want to ask you tonight is, uh, given that at the top of your remarks you made reference to gum disease and to this idea of rot in the American political system, what I want to ask is, suppose an extraterrestrial extra observer looked at the United States and said, the rise of Donald Trump, and that observer looked at Israel and said, the rise of Benjamin Netanyahu, these two leaders, both quite corrupt, unabashed racists, you might say. Netanyahu, not a racist. I'll say, at the very least, he speaks better English than Trump. But <laughs> these two leaders, if the extraterrestrial observer posed to you the question in a non-adversarial way, is the rise and success of these two leaders entirely predictable, given the last 20 years of foreign policy of the United States and Israel, which for whatever reasons, countenances large losses of life for dark-skinned people in defense of white lives. Would you have a lot of disagreement with that statement, total agreement? I'm very interested in your thoughts. Okay. Well, just at the beginning of my talk, I referenced the importance of understanding the danger you face so you know what you're concerned with and what you're not concerned with. Um, uh, the, the, United, the, the situations of the United States and Israel are so non-comparable that you really can't draw analogies between the two. Um, one is a superpower, one is not. Um, one is a long-established country, one is very new. Um, and one has much more deep-rooted bureaucratic and legal institutions than the other institutions are much, are much shallower. Um, and uh, one has a margin of security and the other does not. Um, so Israel has... Um, very specific. I, I, it's not. I don't. I don't. Still don't think it's an analogous situation. Israel has a lot of problems. I'm very keenly aware of them. Um, my oldest girl lived in Israel for four years, and um, and I understand. I, I won't pretend any kind of expert understanding, but I the, that country has deep problems and has deep problems with the stability of its democratic system. Um, but they come from the, the whereas Israel's problems ultimately originate in the foreign threat it faces. America's problems originate as do the problems of the more comparable countries, the, the, the Frances and the Britons and uh, the Italys, um, in America's both cultural and economic situation, the failure uh, to make sure that the gains from economic growth are 
shared in, in a way that strengthens the middle class. Um, and uh, uh, the impact of demographic transition and the inability of the United States um, and other countries uh, to accept that um, high levels of immigration are very destabilizing to the political system. And one of the paradoxes of immigration, of course, is when your, po when your native population falls below replacement levels, as has happened throughout the world, your economy needs immigration. But the countries whose economies most need it are the societies that can least cope with it. And that paradox, which doesn't have easy answers, is I think a big part of what makes um, the United States susceptible to a Trump, makes a France susceptible to uh, the Le Pen family, makes uh, the Netherlands susceptible to Geert Wilders. Um, whereas the situation in Israel looks to me a, a lot more like any kind of, uh, kind of highly militarized state facing an immediate over the border threat. Um, and then you look for a competent war leader, which obviously in Donald Trump we do not have. We have a young woman back here. Okay, actually, let's start bringing the, the questions forward now and, okay. and, and, and going to the sort of the, the side columns as well. Yeah. But thank you. So in your speech today, you talked about using our technology and our phones responsibly. And I wonder, why tell us this when the most influential man, quote unquote, does not use it responsibly, does not tweet responsibly? Um, it's one thing to differentiate your mannerisms from the average politician and act like you're being honest, but it's another thing to tweet as if you're an 11-year-old in middle school. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I'm, not sure that I, I'm not sure that I understand the question because I, I think actually the question cuts the other way. One of the, one of the ways you could lead a very fulfilling and socially responsible life is just to ask yourself before any action, would Donald Trump do or say this? And, and, and if the answer is yes, don't. But maybe, let me hear, a qu I, I think I hear a question underneath your question, which is this. And um, I had an experience, I was at a political event in California this summer, um, and I was saying some of the same things I was saying here, and somebody came up who was a very much an activist type and was very angry with me and didn't like what I was saying. And he said that you want unilateral disarmament. Uh, and if we're going to ever stop Donald Trump, we need to become more like him and to learn from him and to use his methods. He understands things, and he especially understands things about modern communications. And what I said to him, I'll say to you, which is if you use his methods, you don't stop him, you just replace him. Donald Trump is not the, we see Donald Trump's all across the developed world. And as I've question pointed out, we see some Trump-like aspects in Benjamin Netanyahu across the semi-developed world. Um, you know, we see them in Mo Modi and in India and in Zuma and South Africa. Um, there, there's something, uh, the, the, the democratic idea is in real trouble. Uh, and the democratic idea is also about ways people should behave. Um, and it's about limits that you want to see not, that because you want to see them on people who disagree with you, uh, you accept them for yourself. Because uh, Every, because in a democracy, everybody gets turns in power. And you want the people who have the power at any given moment to accept limits. And that means you have to accept limits. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark. I was a foreign policy advisor for Senator Sanders' campaign in 16. I know I'm a political unicorn in that respect. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have a question that's unrelated to both Iraq and Trump, um, and it's about something that happened during the Bush years that you were not a part of, you had left by then, and that's Darfur. That's um, Darfur. Um, you were not there, but you knew many of the people who were making those decisions, and I was wondering if you can explain why nothing was really done, uh, and you know the situation's still ongoing, and what could potentially be done about it? You know, I know there's an implicit promise when you stand on the stage that you can answer any question. <laughs> but I think on this one, I don't know. I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't answer the question. It's just outside my range of knowledge. Sorry. Yes, sir. This man, this man here, the... Um, it, okay. Thank you. Hi. My name is David. First, uh, thank you for coming tonight and for a fascinating evening. I wanted to circle back to the issue of lying again. Um, having the American people lied to is nothing new. It's been happening probably since the beginning of uh, the country. Uh, remember the Maine got us into the Spanish-American War and uh, 
the Tonkin Gulf resolution in Vietnam and WMDs in Iraq. And we've been lied to on really big issues of great import. Now we're being lied to about everything, of things of no import, crowd size, how much money he earned last year, um, and so on and so forth. Could one argue that this is really so much less dangerous? Uh, because fundamentally, nobody believes him. Mm -hmm. uh, if he were to say to us that there are WMDs in some country and we have to invade him, we'd say, ah, get out of here. Uh, because he has no credibility. Okay. Whereas when we were told things in the past, we kind of believed the government, and if they said something, we followed it. Okay, so that's, we're in a university and we can, and, and so that's a provocative question and it, it invites a lot of thinking. And could one argue that? Yeah, one could argue that. Um, but I, here's what I would say is, is sort of different. Um, you're right, um, politicians lie, uh, usually for reasons of self-preservation. Um, uh, presidents lie um, because they often have something in mind that they want to do and they don't think that the country will follow them. Um, you know, the, Franklin Roosevelt lied all the way into World War II um, and uh, lied and lied again. And in the, in the end, with the pre what presidents make a gamble with those kinds of large lies that history will absolve them. Um, and in Roosevelt's case, history really did. In Lyndon Johnson's case, history did not. Um, and uh, I don't believe that George Bush lied about um, WMD, but I believe he was overly credulous. He, it, it wasn't that he, unlike Johnson who knew what the truth about the Gulf of Tonkin, I think Bush deceived himself about the WMD and then the country was misled. But be that as it may, it's this, it, but here's what is different. Um, in, in the, when Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson lied about um, the Gulf of Tonkin situation, uh, but he operated, he gave you the tools to confront him, because he never he never insisted that it was uh, there was no such no difference, um, and when you could demonstrate that the Gulf of Tonkin hadn't happened the way the president said it had happened, that meant something. Results ensued and had consequences. Not maybe not maybe the president himself was dug in at that point, but for his own political party, that, they, that there was a standard by which to um, compel action. And there's a standard by which to organize not just pe like-minded people, but even people who didn't um, agree with you. That a lot of people who thought that Vietnam, North Vietnam, was a threat to the West uh, would also insist. Of course, you know that, it, that the, what the president says has to be so. And if he and if what he said wasn't so, then we have you know the legal basis for the war is in jeopardy and, and so on. Um, what is happening now is is, an, is a dissolution of those standards, and what it, it's an attack. So it's not so much an abuse of presidential power, it is that, but it's also an attack on the way the entire executive branch functions because um, no one can trust anything. The executive branch, people inside the executive branch can't rely on what each other says. Um, and meanwhile, you have um, built a whole third of your country for whom being lied to is a normal part of life. I mean, we just had a very dramatic example of this with the CNN, the story about the CNN town hall questions. Is everyone familiar with this incident? So uh, Fox News accused CNN of manipulating the questions uh, at a town hall. Um, and uh, which, ha I mean, it's not the most important thing in the world, but, and TV is fake, but, but as it happened, um, the basis for this arrested on someone, on the deliberate falsification of a member of the audience. So Fox, which leaned very far forward on making this accusation against a competitor, had, had to step back, except they didn't. Like there's a kind of mumbled, oh well. Um, and uh, that they have created a knowledge community for a third of the country. Which is now, more, which regards um, statements as enti as entirely judged by their political usefulness, divorced from any standard, and that I think is not true of any of the things uh, you mentioned before. Um, Roosevelt assumed if, that if if he was right about Hitler, the country would forgive him for his many deceptions on the way to fighting Hitler. But what he never counted on was uh, he would get into the situation and no one re would remember or care or um, you know that he, you could go on denying it forever and that the whole idea of what is truth would begin to be dissolved. We have time for one more question so we can leave time for the book signing. So may maybe... Uh, right here. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe since you're both side by side, maybe uh, both, both speak and, and I'll try to... 
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try first. My name is Susan Haig. I'm with uh, Civic Story, a nonprofit news site. I have a question about civics and civic learning. You mentioned the low voter rate. And a lot of people regret that there's no longer teaching of civics in schools, although I think we'd all agree that one ninth grade course is hardly going to prepare people for the complexities of self-governance. So I'm just curious as to where you see the responsibility, essentially, for teaching those habits and knowledge and best practices of self-governance. It's a very sophisticated concept. Do you think it's with yeah. parents? Do you think it's with educational institutions? And do you think it's partly with the news media? Go ahead. I'll, I'll try. I'll try to. I'll try to meld them. I'll work them together. I'm not sure you can, though. And then, and then you have a question about monetary policy, and I we're gonna. <laughs> no, Mike. My name's Marie. I'm a PhD candidate here at Rutgers. I have to tell you, I'm a big Trump supporter. I just could not pull that lever for Hillary. I just couldn't do it. My question for you is, is with what happened with Trump, with FISA warrants and weaponizing the intelligence agency. What do you think of the former administration? Okay. Um, let, me, let me take the first question very briefly and then let me deal with the, uh, uh, the second one because I, I'm glad you, you're here and I'm glad, I thank you for the question and thank you for being here and for, for being challenging. Um, uh, so as, as to the civics, um, think about your own children um, and how you raise them to be functioning adults. It's not through a formal curriculum. It's through a process of, from earliest infancy, treating them that they are valued and that what they think matters. And then ask yourself how much of that is going on for the less successful two-thirds of society. Um, are their children being raised to believe that what, what, what they think matters? Um, people become, respo become, responsibil become responsible. They acquire a sense of responsibility from having a sense of, of um, that their decisions will have consequences for themselves and for their immediate community. Um, that's not the way a lot of schools operate. That's not the way a lot of life operates. So I don't think, I, I agree with you, I don't think you can do it with a civics course. Um, the, in former days, and when America was a more rural society, the great school of civic knowledge was the jury. Um, in small towns, everybody had to serve on one sooner or later. And they, and they had power over a fellow human being, over his property, maybe over his life. Um, over his freedom, maybe over his life. And from that jury experience, they learned how to be citizens. Um, and how few of us serve on juries anymore. So if we're thinking about how do we do this, I, I think we should be thinking about how do we make, um, make our children feel that they matter. Um, as, as to, um, uh, look, I, have, I voted for, I did not vote for uh, Donald Trump, but I did vote against President Obama twice. Um, and I have a lot of com uh, complaints against the Obama administration. Um, and uh, I think um, both in, at home and abroad. But on the matter of the FISA warrants, I, have, I can't agree with you. Um, that they, it was obvious to everybody. That, uh, I didn't have access to secret information. I could see the improper, that, that the next president, sorry, the next nominee of the Republican Party was engaged in contacts with Russian intelligence that were completely ominous. And the people, were, and he was surrounded by people and the idea that this would not trigger warnings. Um, you know, when, um, when Henry Wallace ran for president in 1948 and his campaign was penetrated by Soviet agents, when Charles Lindbergh was thinking about running for president in 1940 um, and accepted a, a Nazi medal, um, that, the, that, that these were things that gave real cause for alarm. I mean, what we, um, you know, what we, and where I think where a lot of Republicans who want to defend the president are backing themselves into is, is they're making an argument that a lot of the defense of this turns into this case, that uh, this man, Carter Page, um, who was signaling his availability to be used by, to, by the Russians as an agent, and who was limited by his own incompetence and foolishness, um, and ne maybe never quite became a Russian agent because the Russians regarded him as too useless. But, um, but he was, he was behaving in ways that are an objective security risk and that every conservative and every Republican, would, if that person had been on the left, uh, we, would, we would recognize the symbols. Um, so I, I think uh, you know, that of all the things that, you know, um, you know, I'm a very conservative person. I have a lot of the, you know, as I was uh, saying to some of the people here, I mean, I share still a lot of the sympathy for the foreign policy and the actions of the Bush administration, which I served, and, and, and um, the life I've led since 1980. But 
for me, the, the fundamental organizing issue is the national security of the United States. And if a threat to national security shows up inside the Republican Party, I'm not going to explain it away. I'm going to feel it more because those are my people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you.